Okay. Uh, Kristen McKnight has a biology degree from the University of Montana and was teaching high school science before joining Native Energy in 2011. She has worked in both client relationships and project origination for Native Energy. She now works exclusively on Native Energy's project origination team and focuses on their land use projects such as forest and soil carbon. Project origination and management includes vetting opportunities for carbon, carbon attractiveness, evaluating and managing risk, structuring terms with project proponents, seeing projects through to market, and managing the carbon asset over a project's lifetime. Let's welcome Kristen. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, John. Um, uh, I'm invited here to talk exclusively about the voluntary market, um, so I think this is a transition point into the afternoon. Uh, and I just want to say it's really an honor to be here, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, for some quick background on Native Energy, um, our projects have mostly been renewable energy projects, such as wind turbines, solar, and biogas. Um, those projects are especially in rural areas, on farms, and um, on tribal land in Alaska, native corporations. Um, until recently, we've been waiting for the forest carbon uh, project requirements to mature. Um, but for a couple years now, we've been comfortable with that. Um, and we contracted for our first project in 2013. Um, and since then, we've also bought and resold uh, credits from other projects. Um, we have a relatively long history participating in the Native tribes' uh, carbon cover conversation. In addition to bringing carbon finance to several small-scale tribal renewable energy projects, uh, my colleagues uh, Tom Stoddard, Jeff Bernicke, Tom Rawls, Brian Kilkelly, and Johnny Bearcub um, have attended and presented at numerous meetings and presentations over the years, including here at ITC a couple of times. Uh, for our forestry team, I've taken the lead for the past three years. Um, our in-house technical expertise really is focused on renewable energy. Um, and with my background in biology, uh, my only forestry qualification is that both my parents are foresters, uh, <laughs> which really isn't sufficient. Um, so we, uh, we're partnering with Spatial Informatics Group, um, who's here today to help with some of that uh, forestry expertise as they're good with the inventory and modeling. Uh, so what, what are the big differences in the voluntary and, carbon, uh, voluntary and compliance markets? Um, obviously in the compliance market in the California, uh, there's the one standard. Um, the buyers are regulated, they're required to do it, uh, and there's three project types. Uh, in the voluntary market, the buyers are voluntary. So um, it's a little bit more fickle in that the buyers don't have to be purchasing these offsets. Uh, but there are also multiple standards and multiple project types. Uh, given the concern around the, the strict uh, requirements in California, um, I'm sure the question here is whether or not the voluntary market will provide uh, sort of a more easier and more flexible option uh, to benefit from carbon revenue. So before I try to shine some light on that question, I'll go over some big picture voluntary carbon market information uh, for context. Um, and I discovered last night that the 2015 State of the Voluntary Carbon Market Report just came out. Um, so this data is a little old, um, and I can give you the link to that at the end of the presentation. Um, and in the 2015 report, it shows that demand this year did go up to 87 million tons. Um, but the average price did drop to $3.80. Uh, takeaway from the new report was also that more than half the volume transacted came from forestry and land use projects last year. Um, and even though that 380 is the global average price um, in the voluntary market, the price is much more variable. So there's uh, some tons that are as low as 75 cents or a dollar, um, or they can be higher in the eight to, dollar, uh, eight to nine dollar range. So since one of the primary differences in the voluntary market is that the buyers aren't regulated, who, who are buying these carbon offsets? Um, 
this data is also from the state of the voluntary market 2014. As you can see, most of the buyers are um, corporations and businesses. And so why are they buying? Um, I wanted to spell any thoughts that uh, these are corporations that are buying licenses to pollute. Um, purchasing offsets doesn't come with any of the returns on investment. It comes when companies invest in renewables and efficiencies. Um, so these often, um, these organi organizations have emission reduction targets and offsets are typically a last ditch effort to meet those uh, since it's a non-recoverable cost for them. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll go over some example from our clients. Uh, many of you guys probably know Ben & Jerry's the ice cream company. Um, they're a value-driven company with emission reduction goals. Uh, the majority of their greenhouse gas impact comes from the independent farms that supply the milk and cream for their ice cream. Uh, Native Energy is working with their farmers to pay for manure separation technology that reduces the farm's methane emissions. The separated solids from the manure is also sterile and that provides a bedding alternative for their cows. Um, by replacing the need for them to buy costlier bedding, the project is also increasing the economic viability of the farms. Um, and to increase the economic viability of the farms is also a mission for Ben & Jerry's. On the other side of the value chain, uh, Aveda Salon sell net zero hairspray. In this case, the greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the product's use by the consumer. Um, since Aveda cannot avoid the emissions associated with aerosol, Aveda purchases offsets. In both these cases, cases Ben and & Jerry's and Aveda are relying on native energy and on carbon standards to ensure that the carbon offsets are real and that they're additional and that they've been verified. Uh, here's a quick look at what those standards are in the voluntary market. And I think uh, John Gunn is going to go over these more in depth later on today. Uh, each project requires an eligibility study to really understand which standard uh, best suits the project. Uh, the gold standard uh, is focused on social and environmental projects, um, typically in the developing world, but their newly developed land use uh, methodology can be used anywhere. Um, the verified carbon standard is really the, the leading um, standard, uh, most commonly used standard globally. Um, and they say that they're, uh, they are founded by a collection of business and environmental leaders who saw a need for greater quality assurance in the voluntary carbon markets. And that's what's really important to ensure that there's continued demand for these offsets. Um, ACR, which Jessica talked about earlier, um, I think uh, their mission is a quest to innovate and that, that standard is really great for new land use projects um, to get new methodologies out there. Uh, there's also the Plan Vivo standard, which is exclusively a land use project, um, and that's for rural smallholders and communities dependent on natural resources for livelihoods. Uh, so will the voluntary market work better for tribes? Um, the primary concern for all landowners is the permanence and how, how can you really guarantee what will happen in the forest in 100 years? Um, I obviously don't have an answer for that. I do know the voluntary standards do have shorter time commitments for the most part, closer to 30 to 50 years. Um, as you know, um, tribes also have the additional challenge of sovereign immunity and other land tenure issues. I'm gonna punt that question to Eric Giles this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, he, his qualifications at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation really uh, qualifies him better to answer that question than I do. Um, I'll say from a market perspective, it's important to have rigorous standards. Um, there are consumer protection. Uh, they also ensure that there's a continued demand uh, for real carbon reductions. Uh, but it's a constant give and take to develop protocols that are both accountable uh, and rigorous, but also workable for the project owners. Uh, for illustration, um, I'll just provide a couple examples of our land use projects. Our Oka reforestation project is reforesting 70 hectares 
uh, with a sale of 50,000 offsets. Um, 35 of those hectares were planted last year. Another 35 will be planted this year. Um, these saplings were planted on private land, just marginal land that's not being used for anything else. Uh, the gold standard has created a mechanism uh, to support reforestation projects by issuing what are called validated CO2 certificates. Um, in this case, the planted saplings that really won't sequester significant carbon for another 15 or 20 years um, are able to be funded by the sale of these validated CO2, CO2 certificates in the first year of the project. And then over the next 50 years, the carbon from those trees will be verified and issued to the buyers. Here's a, the Palouse Soil Carbon Project, a project in development. Um, we're still not yet to a point where we're comfortable marketing it to our clients, um, but it's an interesting case study. Uh, this project would incentivize wheat producers in the Pacific Northwest to switch to direct seed farming which sequesters carbon in the soil. Uh, the data that supports this has been gathered, but now we're working to get a methodology approved by the ACR, um, true to its quest to innovate. Um, there's two sticking points right now. One is that we need to show that the adoption rate for direct seeding is low enough that it's com not common practice. Um, and then the other one is uh, that we need to get a no action request approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission saying we are not violating the 1933 Security Act. Uh, if you have more questions about that, I'll have to talk to our, my colleague who's a lawyer because I don't really understand it. <laughs> um, for some background on how a project, a project developer's perspective on assessing new projects, these are several um, categories of risk that we use to evaluate projects. Um, a development risk would be that around whether or not the project would be built. Performance would be whether or not it's going to operate over the period of time that we'd expect it to. Um, a validation and, and carbon asset risk would be around whether or not the project could meet those requirements under the carbon standard or if we could get a new methodology validated, just like we're doing in the Palouse. Uh, a volume risk would be whether or not uh, the project would reduce the carbon that we expect it to and that we've forecasted. Um, a counterparty risk is whether or not there's sufficient commitment from a car counterparty or whether or not they have the expertise to, to carry out um, the project activity. Project attractiveness is a, a major risk, which is whether or not our clients, especially here in the voluntary market, is whether or not uh, the clients would support the project. Um, and ad additionality is an important risk, which is whether or not the project um, would have happened without the role of carbon offsets. Another question is certainly how costs compare in the voluntary market. Again, this is a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but voluntarily, vo voluntary projects similarly require feasibility studies, inventory, documentation, validation, verification, and, and monitoring. Um, grants or other sources of funding are very likely needed to, to make a project work. Uh, I also think John Gunn is going to be getting into this this afternoon. To help understand how these projects fit together and what stage your project might be in the proje project, Eric Giles at the National Indian Carbon Coalition and John Gunn of SIG are excellent resources. Um, Eric's organization provides an education bridge to tribes to better understand how they can benefit from the carbon markets and what that entails. And as we know, uh, education and managing expectations on this pro process is key to having a successful project. Um, John Gunn's organization um, is able to dig into an individual project to evaluate its technical and economic eligibility under the various carbon standards. Uh, combine their organizations, make a project move to the point where a carbon project developer can engage. So here's a link to the, um, which is if you want to spend some more time reviewing the voluntary market, um, to the 2014 report. Again, I have a link up here to the 2015 report if you'd like that. Um, now back to the original question is whether or not the voluntary market really will offer an easier or more flexible 
option to um, benefit from carbon revenue, there really is no clear answer, of course. Um, if there is demand for the project, if it's attractive and additional, and if the project owner is committed and willing to invest um, and able to leverage other sources of funding, then yes, there can be more flexibility to make a project work in the voluntary market. I can say at least that uh, Native Energy also considers tribal projects or um, projects on Alaska Corporation land to be very attractive to our clients. Um, in the voluntary market, where there's a will, there is a way. Um, the most successful projects will be where carbon sequestration, and I believe this is echoing what um, others have said, um, will be where carbon sequestration generally aligns with other tribes, with the tribe's land management mission. In this case, uh, the carbon market could provide a really synergistic and necessary tool to help finance a tribe's long-term land management goals. And I think I've left time for questions. 